Okay, high key. This is one of my favorite Blender features coming in a future version of Blender, and I'm about to tell you all about it, so stick around. Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of CGC Weekly here on the CG Cookie Blender Training YouTube channel. About a year and a half ago, Blender introduced Micro Polygon Displacement, which was a revolutionary tool that really got a lot of hype going in the Blender community. And when I say a lot of hype, there were a lot of YouTube videos, a lot of people playing with it, a lot of people destroying it, just a ton of things everybody loved Micro Polygon Displacement, myself included. And honestly, Micro Polygon Displacement is still one of my absolute favorite tools in Blender to date. That's why I was really excited to see that this year, Blender is adding another level of Micro Polygon Displacement to Blender, this time using vectors. This awesome feature is called Vector Displacement, and we're going to take a look at it right now. Before we go any further though, I want to give you guys a good explanation of how Vector Displacement works and how it's different from the standard Micro Polygon Displacement that already exists within Blender. We're back at the whiteboard. All right, so to get started here, we first need to understand how, what is it, how, what, what are they even called? Micro displacement and um, what's the other one? Vector displacement work. Wow, I can't even remember the topic of my own video. Anyway, both of these work off of a factor called uh, adaptive subdivision. So basically what adaptive subdivision does is it takes your resolution that you're rendering and it divides the pixels into the amount of polygons that you would need in your scene. Right? So it has this factor called dicing scale. And dicing scale is basically just another way to say number of pixels per polygon. So a dicing scale of one will yield one pixel per polygon, right? So one pixel per polygon. A dicing scale of four yields four pixels per polygon, right? So the polygon went from being about this small to being like that, right? And a dicing scale of say 16 would mean 16 pixels per polygon. You get the idea. Um, as you increase the number for dicing scale, the less high resolution your mesh becomes because the polygons slowly and surely get bigger and bigger. Now, both micro displacement and vector displacement utilize adaptive subdivision in order to get such high resolution um, outcomes without using a ton of memory because if you had to subdivide your entire model like that it would be kind of crazy but because of the way adaptive subdivision works something that is very close will receive a lot more polygons to something that is very far away because something that's far away will take up less space when applied to perspective and things that are much closer will have you know a lot more pixels going through them and therefore a lot more detail so how does standard displacement work well Standard displacement works along the normal line of a plane. So say we have a plane here, and we have a normal line coming through the center. And for those of you that don't know, a normal line is a line that is perpendicular to the face of the 2D object, right? In this case, it's a plane. And regular displacement basically moves a ton of vertices up and down along this normal line. Okay, so what I've basically drawn out here is a height map in its most basic form, or displacement map in its most basic form. Dark spots represent zero, light spots represent one, and then these are all kind of in between flow values. So zero, 0 0.33, 0 0.66, one, 0 0.66, and zero, right? That's the shading for our imaginary map here. And basically, these say how much we should offset these pixels along the normal, right? Here is our normal line, right there, that's our normal, um, for our final result. So, I'm gonna use a green marker. So these are the original pixel locations, and basically I'm gonna use the green marker here to represent where these would be moved to um, in considering we applied this displacement map to them. So 0.33 would move zero, or sorry, let's start here, zero. So this first one would move zero units up, so we'll just draw it straight over that. 0.33 would move 0.33 units up, 0.66 would move 0.66 units up, so right there. One would move one whole unit up, 0.66 again, and zero. So our new geometry would look like this. Perfect. So you'll notice that all of these just moved straight up from their original counterpart. So that is how a displacement map works. That's in its most basic, most generic form. Vector displacement works a little bit differently though. 
Okay, we'll pretend those are in a straight line even though they're slanting a little bit this way. So a vector displacement map allows things to break away from the normal. So previously, we were restricted to moving up and down only. But vector displacement is kind of cool in the fact that it allows you to not only move up and down, but also left and right and forward and backward. So instead of just having this up and down component, we can now move our circle up and this way, right? In a vector quantity. And now we have a resultant vector. And now our new point gets drawn here. Now, isn't that neat? So let's go ahead and continue doing something similar to this for all of these, except I'm gonna draw different vectors for each individual one, and then we're gonna connect them in the end to see what the final geometry looks like. Also, I should probably highlight that in green. All right, so here is our new geometry. It looks a lot messier, but if we get rid of these, uh, our little vector lines here, our new topology in the same order that they were connected down here, right? From one to two, from two to three, from three to four, to four to five, to five to six. All of a sudden, we get this. We have, in this area right here, an overlap. All this area is overhanging another piece. And if we were just displacing across the normal, this wouldn't be accomplishable. And that's what makes vector displacement such an intriguing aspect of Blender and CG in general, is this extra space, the ability to have actual overhangs, crevices, and nooks and crannies that wouldn't be able to um, be created in the first place. All right, so let's actually look at a demo of uh, this vector displacement in cycles. So I just have the basic scene loaded up here. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete everything in the scene we don't need. We'll keep the starter cube. I'll reset my cursor to the center just because it's bothering me that it's not in the center. You have no idea how much that bothers me. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's go ahead and look at what vector displacement looks like when applied to this cube here. So uh, the first thing I need to do here is switch over the experimental feature set because it is, well, micro displacement and adaptive subdivision is all uh, experimental. So I'm going to come over into our modifiers tab here, add a subdivision surface modifier. We'll just set it to, uh, we'll keep it at Catmull Clark, uh, and we'll set the uh, render mode to adaptive. Sweet. Um, so the next thing we need to do is actually add a material. I'll click use nodes so we can actually you know, use nodes with our material here. Um, switch over into the node editor. Also, dig in this new menu. Look at that, that looks slick. Um, and of course, with our node editor, we have our good old node editor. But the one, the one thing you'll notice, get it, node is, but, but the one, in reality, the one thing you will notice is, <laughs> why am I laughing at this? <laughs> okay, the one thing you will recognize is that the uh, displacement input on our material output node is actually a vector input instead of the typical float input that um, would be gray, right? So it's blue instead of gray. Um, and this is because we need to give it a vector input in order for it to get an actual displacement output. So uh, there's actually some handy nodes that they added in so we can work with this. One of those being the vector displacement node. And this is great for using vector displacement maps. So if we'll hook up the uh, displacement output into our uh, material output displacement input. And we'll go ahead and add an image texture, uh, open it up, and I have a vector displacement map sitting on my desktop of an ear, right? So we'll go ahead and position this accordingly, and we'll give this some sort of instructions as to how to operate geometry. Now we want texture coordinate. I always get the texture coordinate node mixed up with other things. And we'll just, I'm just hooking up the generated output into the vector input over here. I'm changing this from flat to box. And um, now if we press Shift Z, wow, that is one demented ball of very deformed ears. Um, so obviously I screwed something up here. Um, it's kind of weird working with these daily builds because things change a lot. So we're gonna really quick troubleshoot and see if we can figure out what the problem is, but I already have an idea. So let's go ahead and change this over to simple. I think this will, yeah, there we go. That somewhat fixes our problem. But there you go. So here, you can see this ear. This isn't a great example. It still seems like there are some issues going on. But you can see here that our vector displacement map is overhanging itself, right? There is, a visible gap right here that wouldn't normally be able to exist. And this is what makes vector displacement maps so fantastic. So let's go ahead and actually look at these vector displacement maps on a, or in a scenario that is a little bit more um, applicable in like an actual render instead of just a bunch of ears on a cube. Because honestly, not gonna lie, this is kind of freaking me out.
So yeah, that kind of gives you an idea of exactly what vector displacement can do. It can really take just a low poly, very low resolution model and just max out the detail and just really make things look pretty, especially while capturing all those cavities and creases that I talked about in the uh, super inform Ooh, I just hit my mic. Super informative part of this video. Anyway, thank you all for watching, and I hope you guys learned something new from this video. If you did, be sure to hit the like button down below and also hit the subscribe button because subscribing is good for you and for us, both of us. It's a mutual symbiotic relationship. If you guys want to learn all about a bunch of other different Blender features, workflows, tips and tricks, head over to cgcookie.com and hook yourself up with a subscription. There's so much Blender knowledge available on the site for you guys to absorb. So, I'm trying to figure out why this isn't working. Ha, ha, ha.